Let, let's go to the book of Ruth. Um, the book of Ruth. Starting at or, um, chapter 1 um, and beginning at verse 1. Just to make sure that we're all on one accord and on the same page, what's the book, what's the chapter, and what's the verse? All right, look, somebody was paying attention. Amen. Hallelujah. Ruth, chapter 1, verse 1. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. You can uh, read along whatever version you have. In the days when the judges ruled in Israel. A severe famine came upon the land, so a man from Bethlehem in Judah left his home and went to live in the country of Moab, taking his wife and two sons with him. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife was Naomi. Uh, their two sons were Mahlon and Kilian. Uh, they were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, the land of Judah, and when they reached Moab, they settled there. Then Elimelech died, and Naomi was left with her two sons. The two sons married Moabite women, and one woman was named or Orpah, and the other woman was Ruth. Um, but about ten years later, both Malon and Kilian died. This left Naomi alone without her two sons or her husband. Um, then Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had blessed his people in Judah by giving them good crops again. So Naomi and her daughters-in-law got ready to leave Moab to return to her homeland. With her two daughter daughters-in-law, she set out from the place where she had been living, and they took the road that would lead them back to Judah. But on the way, Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go back to your mother's homes, and may the Lord reward you for, reward you for your kindness uh, to your husband's and to me, may the Lord bless you with the security of another marriage. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they all broke down and wept. No, they said, we want to go with you. Uh, but Naomi replied, why should you go with me? Can I still give birth to another son who can grow up to be your husband's? No, my daughters, return to your parents' home, for I am too old to marry again. And even if it were possible, I were to get married tonight and bear a son, what then? Would you wait to grow up, wait for them to grow up and refuse to marry someone else? No, of course not, my daughters. Uh, things are far more bitter for me than for you, um, because the Lord himself has raised his, fence, his fist against me. And again, they wept together, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth, clutching tightly to Naomi, look, Naomi, uh, said to her, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods. You should do the same. But Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you or and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. Um, and we're almost done. It's a lot of reading, but I promise I'm not going to preach that long. So the two of them continued on their journey, and when they came to Bethlehem, uh, the entire town was excited by their arrival. Is that really Naomi? The women asked. Don't call me Naomi, she respond, responded. Instead, call me Mara, for the Almighty has made life very bitter for me. And we can hang our hats here. Uh, Naomi says, don't call me Naomi. Instead, call me Mara. For the Almighty has made life very bitter for me. And if we could tag this text with a trendy title, we would simply call it Lemonade. Have a seat in the name of our God. God, we thank you for this opportunity for preaching. We ask now that you decrease me and increase in me, that your people may be edified, your name be glorified, and the devil be horrified. God, we love you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, on April 
23rd, 2016, a wave hit the world uh, in the form of a song and subsequent video album, album and video album called Lemonade by Beyonce. Amen. Um, very interesting how she discussed her, her life and her situations and how uh, life had became somewhat bitter or sour for her because of the activities that her husband was engaging in and how even in spite of the situation, how bitter and how sour it was, she was still able to make something out of it. So it is for us in life, where even though in this moment we have graduated, we feel good, we've reached certain levels of achievement, the process to get us there sometimes can be very, very bitter. This is a sim simmering situation we find in the scenes of our scripture as it relates to our main character, Naomi. Naomi uh, has been given a life full of lemons. Uh, this narrative begins during the time of Judges where Israel and God were uh, going tick for tack between sin, punishment, and restoration. It was not the best time for Naomi. Uh, during this time, it was a famine that hit the land, and food and rain were scarce. It was not the best time for Naomi. Um, she and her husband, Elimelech, moved from Bethlehem, her hometown, and one of God's holy places, to the pagan of city of Moab. Uh, when they got to Moab, Naomi, Naomi's husband, much like Beyonce's, or much different from Beyonce's husband, leaves her, not for another woman, but Elimelech dies. It was not the best time for Naomi. Uh, then her two sons marry Moabite women, not good, wholesome Israelite women, but pagan women who are descendants from girls who intentionally engaged in an incestuous relationship encounter with their father. It was not the best times uh, for Naomi. Then after 10 years living in a foreign land with only two familiar faces, she, with the only two familiar faces she has left, uh, they suddenly, her beloved boys, die. And they know Naomi up until this point has been living a, li a lemon-like life. So much so that when she gets a word that there is a harvest in her homeland, she attempts to go back to Bethlehem, but being so broken and battered by her situation, she pushes her daughters-in-law away. Uh, her daughters-in-law were the only things that she had left, the only things that she had after losing her husband and her two sons. She convinces one to leave, uh, but one refuses, uh, 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 one refuses to leave and says, I will go with you. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. And when they finally return to Moab, I mean, return to Bethlehem, Naomi and Ruth, uh, Naomi is so sour because of of her situations, she says, don't call me Naomi, but call me Mara, because the Lord has dealt bitterly with me. What's interesting is, is what Naomi says and how she says it, because she's talking through her, her pain, uh, but I also believe that she's proclaiming a prophecy. Here it is. Uh, Naomi means sweet or beautiful. Mara means bitter. But what's interesting about Mara, Mara is also a place, the name of a place that the Israelites encountered in Bethlehem, where there were some bitter waters, but God instructed Moses to drop a log in the waters, and the bitter waters became sweet. So Naomi here, even though she is 
talking through pain. I believe she's prophesying over her own situation because even though the Lord has dealt bitterly with her, God still has the power to turn her situation around. And here is my Chick-fil-A theology. Are you ready? How is it do you make good lemonade. Well, you take some lemons. That is life. That is your situations. That is your problems. That's your issues. That's the things that you go through. Then you take some sweetener. That is a Naomi because Naomi's name means sweet. So if you place yourself in the story, then the sweetener is you and I. And then lastly, to make real, real good lemonade, you got to add some water. And water always represents the presence of God. And when you mix all that up with some sour situations, some sweetener, which is you and I, and some water, you get some real, real good lemonade. But the key to this is, is that you have to make sure you maintain a certain level of sweetness in order to keep the whole thing from going bad. Here it is right here. Let me come get you. No matter how bitter your backgrounds, no matter how sour your situations, no matter how lemon-like your lamentation may be, uh, you still have to maintain who you are. You cannot let the bitterness of life turn you sour because if you let the laments of life change you, you won't be able to recognize what God is trying to give you uh, to bring you out. Uh, all I'm trying to tell you is that even in the midst of your Mara madness, uh, you can drop a log of blessing in my bit. God will drop a log of blessings in my bitter waters uh, and turn them sweet again. And if I, allow, if I allow the calamities of life to regulate my character, I would never see God working in the midst of it all. And is there anybody in here who knows that God still has the power to turn some things around? God still has the power, the power to make some sour situations sweet again. So, so uh, you have to maintain who you are, even in the midst of sour situations. So the question now becomes, how can I be encouraged to maintain myself in the midst of my sour situations? Well, the recipe for revelation always reveals three things. So to show y'all that I'm cooking with the right ingredients, God has revealed three things to show us how to maintain our sense of self and not change who we are in the midst of sour situations. If you're ready, say, bring them on. In order to maintain yourself in sour situations, you have to recognize that you're in an evaluable season. A season that you're able to evaluate. Uh, for over 10 years, Naomi lived in Moab. Not of her own choice, but it was Elimelech who brought her, who brought Naomi and their two sons from, Moab, from Bethlehem to Moab because there was a famine. Moab is a place of dysfunction. Uh, as previously stated, the descendants of Moab were descendants of an incestuous relationship. Moab was a pagan city. Bethlehem, however, was a place of promise and the presence of God and the place where the future poster posterity would lead to Jesus Christ, the Savior. So, so Elimelech moves Naomi from a place of promise to a, fake, a place of dysfunction. How many times are we going to let the Elimelechs of our lives drag us out of the will of God into a place of dysfunction uh, because we perceive there is a famine or a drought in our lives? Uh, 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 you know you've been keeping yourself for your husband. You've been trying to do the right thing about yourself even though uh, little Susie down the street is sleeping with every Tom, Dick, and Harry and she's married now with three kids. It seems like you've been dealing with this and you've been struggling trying to keep it together and you can't find a man and then all of a sudden in the midst of what seems to be a famine and a limelight comes by and, and tells you and convinces you to leave God's place of promise to go into a place of dysfunction and what I'm trying to tell you is is that you can't allow the limelights of your life to keep you out of the will of God even in a famine the safest place to be is in God's will because even in a famine if I'm in the 
will of God, God will make sure that I survive it. What's interesting is uh, Elimelech moves Naomi from Bethlehem to Moab and Elimelech died. Uh, 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 here is what Naomi does. Uh, Elimelech dies. Uh, her sons die. So she takes an evaluation of her circumstance. Uh, she looks around and says, uh, uh, my husband's gone. Well, I moved from promise to dysfunction. In this dysfunction, my husband died. My two sons died. It may be time for me to leave Moab and to go back to Bethlehem. And that's just a word for somebody in here. You're in an evaluable season, a season where God has given you the opportunity to take a look around at what's going on and figure out if you're in a place of dysfunction or if you're in a place of promise. Because God will keep you in dysfunction, but he'll only keep you for so long. And if you keep looking around, your friends done got locked up, people done died, people done got fired off of their job. And if you're not pay atten paying attention, you don't miss the cues that God gives you uh, to look around your situation and move yourself out of dysfunction. Uh, but when you're in an valuable season, uh, that's God's opportunity uh, to allow you to be able to move from dysfunction uh, and go back to the place of promise. You have to leave Moab and go back to Bethlehem. How do you keep yourself uh, keep who you are, maintain yourself in the midst of sour situations. You have to recognize you're in an invaluable season, a season where you can evaluate for yourself and see that I'm in dysfunction and I need to get back into the will of God. But secondly, in order to maintain yourself and keep yourself in the midst of sour situations, you have to recognize that God has given you an educational emptiness. Let the church say educational emptiness. When Naomi returns to Bethlehem, she tells the people that she left full and came back empty. This was because during the social climate of that day, during that time, uh, a woman's marriage, her having a, hum, a husband, determined her economic and social status. Contrary to women today, I know we're I-N-D-E-P-E-D-E-E-N-T. Uh, uh, do you know what that means? She got her own house. She got her own car, uh, two jobs, work hard. She a bad. If you ain't on, sit down. I'm sorry. I thought I was back in Maryland. Uh, um, women in the historical Hebrew society were not members of society at all if they did not have a husband. And if her husband died, then her financial and social security is dependent upon her sons. So when Naomi returns to Bethlehem, she literally has nothing but Ruth. She was empty. Uh, has anybody ever dealt with emptiness before? Uh, got no money in the bank. Empty. Ain't got no honey empty. Uh, and your, 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 strain, your change is strained. Your, your, your quarters is out of order. Uh, your money is funny. Your pennies, you ain't got many. Empty. Uh, uh, the bills are overdue. Empty. I'm doing everything I can, but I still got sickness in my body. Empty. I'm struggling to get this education, but I can't afford it. Empty. My kids is acting crazy. Empty. The cat is chasing the dog. Empty. I, I don't know what to do. Empty. I'm missing instruction. Empty. Has anybody ever been empty before? Naomi, she lost her husband. She lost her son. She lost her financial security. She lost her, her social status. The only thing she had left was Ruth. But the education in emptiness is simply, simply this, is learning how to use what you have left instead of lamenting over what was lost. It was Ruth 
who Naomi had left in spite of everything else that was going on. It was Ruth who was the one who got Naomi a food, who went out into the fields and worked the field so that her and Naomi could find something to eat. It was Ruth who got married to Boaz and, 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 and secured her financial and social security. It was Ruth who through her posterity there that Jesus Christ would be born. You got to stop lamenting over what was lost uh, and look at what you have left. Uh, I know I have some witnesses in here who are used to living on empty uh, but, low, but learn how to use what you have uh, in order to survive. It was my grandmama who worked on a babysitter salary, who worked, who worked and babysitted five kids uh, and was able to save up money, got a new job, uh, and somebody broke into her house and stole 10000 of her dollars. Uh, but she was able to live on empty uh, because while she was working and babysitting she saved up enough money that when they broke in she just went and bought another house. Uh, it was black folk uh, who were living on empty uh, who we didn't have anything uh, where people didn't want us to have nothing uh, where we were the lower class of society uh, and people didn't want to give us nothing uh, and we were living on empty uh, so we had to go and make it for ourselves uh, and it was when we were on empty uh, that we started our own business it was when we were on empty uh, that we grew our own crops. It was when we were on empty uh, that set the foundation for everything, the privilege that we have today. It was even God uh, in creation uh, who had nothing uh, and was able to use what he had, which was the word, uh, and speak the stars into the sky uh, and speak the moon into the sky uh, and speak uh, vegetation out of the earth uh, and split the waters uh, and let the animals grow. So you got to learn how not to lament over what you lost. But when you're empty, the education is looking at what I got left and seeing what God can use through me in order to bring back my destiny. Is there anybody in here who knows that God is able to do exceeding and abundantly above all you can ask or think? Wait a minute. According to the power that works within you. So that means uh, even on empty I'm not really empty uh, because I got the power of God in order to maintain yourself in the midst of sour situations you have to look at your evaluable season a season where you can evaluate and see if I'm in the will of God or if I'm outside the will of God. Because if we can be honest, some of our sour situations are because we're outside of the will. Okay. Uh, second thing is you have to recognize God has given you an educational emptiness. That is, when I don't have anything, God, stills empower, God still empowers me to use what I have left in order to survive. But lastly, in order to maintain yourself in sour situations, you have to recognize God's evolutionary grace. In every trial and tribulation, God gives grace to cover us and keep us in situations where we should have never made it out. God's hand of grace was on Naomi, and it's evident throughout this entire narrative. A famine hits the land, that means no food or water, but somehow Naomi and her family were able to survive a trip across the Middle Eastern hot desert from Bethlehem to Moab. That's grace. Naomi leaves a place of promise for a place of dysfunction. Everybody who she came with dies, yet Naomi lives. That's grace. Uh, she purposes herself to push everyone away because she's so distraught, distraught but her daughter-in-law refuses to leave her side. That's grace. Uh, she hears that their famine is over in her hometown. That's grace. 
Uh, she travels back across the de desert, a trip that took the support of four people. She did it with just her and Ruth. That's grace. She came back to Bethlehem empty, but apparently still had some place for her and Ruth to live. That's grace. Ruth goes out to work in the field for food, and Naomi doesn't have to lift a finger. That's Grace, Ruth, a Moabite woman, finds favor with an Israelite man. That's grace. Ruth has a child that Naomi benefits from. Grace is evident throughout the entire narrative. But God's evolutionary grace is displayed when you connect the beginning of the story to the end of the story. Here it is. Uh, the story Open, the story's opening line is in the days when judges ruled. Uh, the end of the story outlines the lineage of David, the greatest king of Israel. It was in the time of judges people did what was right in their own eyes. It was during the reign of David that people followed God. It was during the time of judges that the Israelites strayed from God. But it was during the time of David uh, that, that David was called a man after God's on hard. Uh, can I take it a little bit further? Uh, it was through uh, the evolution of time and the lineage of David that Jesus would make his way into the world and save us uh, from our sins. Uh, so what is evolutionary grace? Uh, evolutionary grace is simply this. Uh, God taking me through judges uh, to get me to Jesus. Uh, and is there anybody in here uh, that knows that God will take you through some judges-like situation, uh, some up and down situations, uh, some famines in your life, uh, some sour situations, uh, some bitter backgrounds, uh, some Mara madness uh, in order to get you through salvation. Uh, that, that's why I'm glad uh, he took me through some stuff. Uh, in order that he could save me. Uh, he took me through the gutter uh, in order to expose me to his glory. Uh, he took me through hard times uh, and only to get me to heavenly places. Uh, and can you do me one favor? And uh, can you turn to your neighbor? Uh, now, see, look, y'all not paying me no attention here. Can you turn to your neighbor? Uh, no, no, I said turn. Turn, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, the way you maintain yourself in the midst of sour situations is by blessing God in the midst of it. Because if you don't know why you should bless God, the simple reason is this. You've been through hell and high water. Uh, you've been through rough situations. Uh, you've been through troubled times. Uh, you've been through hard times. Uh, but the blessed God part is this. Uh, you survived it. Uh, and is there anybody, uh, is there anybody in the room uh, who can bless God right there uh, and lift your hands and say, uh, thank you, Lord, uh, because I'm me over uh, when I look back over my life uh, and I see where he brought me from uh, I can truly say uh, that I've been blessed uh, and that I've got a testimony uh, can you high five your neighbor right there uh, and say neighbor oh, oh, oh neighbor I got 
a testimony because I made it through the famine. Uh, some people may have left me. Uh, some people may have walked out on me. Uh, some people may have turned their back on me. Uh, but even in the midst of the famine, uh, God still kept me. Uh, if I got a witness in here, uh, say yes. Uh, say yes. Oh, yes. Can you thank God right there and say, God, I love you. God, I thank you. God, I bless you because you kept me in the midst of a famine. If I got a witness in here, say yeah. Say yeah. Say yeah. 